Okay, we we have um, we have a quorum of four members, so I'm going to start. Welcome, everyone. I am Sharon Green Middleton, Vice President of the Baltimore City Council and Chair of the Economic and Community Development Committee. We are here this afternoon for uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, or really five bills and one legislative oversight. And in attendance, we have members of the committee. I see um, Councilman Bullock was here. Thank you, Madam Chair. I see Councilman Glover. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I see Councilman Stokes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And that's um, a quorum. And uh, I don't see any other visiting council members. Mem and um, just popped in. I see um, Councilman Conway. Hello, Councilman. Hello, Councilman. Uh, hello, uh, Madam Chair. Okay, members from the Office of the President. I see Nikki Thompson. Madam Chair. And is Matt Stegman here? Or Lucy Font? Don't see them as of yet. Representing the mayor's office. I see um, Nikki Thimulus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Did you say Nikki Thimulus? Or I thought it was Nina. Um, Nina. <laughs> Thank you. That's pretty good. Councilman Stokes. <laughs> Okay, before I begin, I would like to remind you that if you are not speaking, please keep yourself on mute. Please uh, do not take yourself off of mute unless you are recognized by the chair. When recognized, please identify yourself in the agency or organization that you represent. Once you have finished speaking, please put yourself back on mute. And also from the president's office, I see Daria Brown. Daria, did I pronounce your name right? It's Daria. Thank you, Madam Chair. Daria. Okay. Okay. So let's begin. Bill number 21-0029R, approval for the exchange of a class BD7 license to a class A7 license, 1801 East North Avenue, for the purpose of providing the required approval to allow the license holder at 1801 East North Avenue to apply to the Board of Liquor License Commissioners to exchange their class BD7 license for a class A7 beer, wine, and liquor license. The bill was introduced on March 8th, 2021. The bill is sponsored by Councilman Stokes. Councilman Stokes, you have comments before we move on. Real quick, it's just transferring a BD7 license to an A7 license, and New Broadway East have a letter of support for this transfer. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we also have present with us uh, Councilwoman Ramos. Thank Councilwoman. you, Madam Chair. Sorry to be late. No problem. Uh, the committee will now hear from the agency representatives and we'll start with the city solicitor's office. Um, I see Hillary Rooley from the law department. Actually, it's Elena for these bills. Uh, Madam uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Hi, <laughs> Elena. Hi, <laughs> Elena. You're on. Okay. So this is the mechanism by which the state law about this particular type of transfer um, requires the uh, applicant to get approval from the city council. So the way you do that is you pass an ordinance that that shows the council um, approves of this particular transfer. So that's what this is. Um, all three of them. Thank you. You're welcome. 
The um, Board of List, uh, Liquor License Commissioners, uh, Nick Blendy. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and good afternoon. Uh, Nicholas Blendy, Deputy Executive Secretary for the Board of Liquor License Commissioners for Baltimore City. Uh, we stand by our report, and I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee might have. Thank you. Department of Finance. Good afternoon, Mara James for the Department of Finance. Uh, we stand by our report. We do not oppose this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. Uh, the Police Department. Michelle Witzberger or Shannon uh, Conway? Michelle or? Good afternoon, Madam Chair. This is Shannon. Uh, BPD right. stands by our report. We do not have any objection to this bill. Thank you. The Department of Transportation. Madam Chair, this is Liam Davis, Baltimore City DOT. We stand by our bill report. No objection. Thank you, Liam Davis. And the Health Department. Thank you, Madam Chair. DePaul Never on behalf of the Baltimore City Health Department. Uh, we stand by our report. Uh, no objections. Um, this business was found to be in good standing with our environmental health officers. Thank you. Uh, the committee will now take public testimony. Uh, Computer users, please use the raise hand function. If you wish to testify when called upon, please state your name before testifying. Attendees who call in will be unmuted one by one. Callers will hear two beeps when unmuted. If you do not wish to testify, please say so when you are unmuted. If you do wish to testify, please state your name. Um, so we're... No hands We're checking and there are no hands raised and no telephone callers. So for um, Bill 21-0029R, um, do I have a motion to move the bill? Move the bill. Moved second. by Stokes and second by Conway. Yes. So that moves favorable. Um, Chair Middleton, yes. Councilman Bullock? Yes. Yes. Councilman Dorsey is absent. Councilman uh, Conway? Yes. Is a yes. Councilman Glover? Yes. Is a yes. Councilwoman Ramos? Yes. yes. Is a yes, and Councilman Stokes? Yes. Is a yes. This bill is approved, um, and this will be moved to second reader. The next bill, 21-0030R, and this is the approval for the exchange of a Class BD7 license to a Class A7 license. And this is 1232 North Caroline Street for the purpose of providing the required approval to allow the license holder at 1232 North Caroline Street to apply for the board to the board of liquor license commissioners to exchange their class BDC7 license for a class A7 beer, wine, and liquor license. This bill was also introduced on March 8th, 2021. And the sponsor is also Councilman Stokes. Uh, the committee will now hear the agency reports. We'll start with the city solicitor's office. Good afternoon again, Elena DePetra for the city solicitor's office. Um, again, we approve this bill for formal legal sufficiency. It follows the requirements of the state law. Thank you, Elena. Um, the Board of Liquor License Commissioners, Nick Blendy. Good afternoon again, Madam Chair, Nicholas Blendy for Deputy Executive Secretary of the Board of Liquor License Commissioners. And uh, same as the last one, uh, the agency stands by its report. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And the Department of Finance, Mara James. Yes, good afternoon, Mara James. Uh, same as the last one, we stand by our report. We do not oppose. Thank you. And the Police Department, Shannon Conway. Good afternoon, I, I, Madam, 
Okay, go ahead, That's sorry. Right. You can go ahead. Sorry, uh, Councilwoman, I was having technical difficulties during the, the last hearing. Um, we, we stand by our report. Thank you, uh, Michelle Wisberger. And the Department of Transportation, Liam Davis. Madam Chair, <laughs> excuse me, Liam Davis, Baltimore City DOT. We stand by our bill report, no objection. Thank you, Liam. And the Health Department, DePaul Nibber. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, DePaul Nibber on behalf of the Baltimore City Health Department. Uh, again, this business was found to be uh, in good standing, and so we have no objections. We stand by our report. Thank you. And uh, the committee will check for public testimony. And we see no hand raised or um, callers. So the next bill, number 21-0031R. Madam Chair, are we going to vote on this one? Oh, look, I'm moving forward. Yes, we do want to vote, um, Mr. Sponsor. Um, and of course, is there a motion to move the bill? So moved by Council okay. Stokes. So moved by Councilman Second Stokes. By Conway. Second by Conway. This bill will move uh, favorable. Um, Chair Middleton, yes. Uh, Councilman Bullock? Yes. Is a yes. Councilman Dorsey, absent. Uh, Councilman Conway? Yes. Is a yes. Councilman Glover? Yes. Is a yes. Councilwoman Ramos? Yes. Is a yes. And Councilman Stokes? Yes. Is a yes. This bill will um, move favorable. I mean, it, at the, this bill will move to second reader. And we also have joining us um, today is Councilman Yitzi Slifer of the 5th District. Hello, Councilman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then now we'll move to bill number 21-0031R, and this also is approval for the exchange of a class BD7 license to a class A7 license. And this address is 1041 Greenmont Avenue. And it's also for the purpose of providing the required approval to allow the license holder at 1041 Greenmont Avenue to apply to the Board of Liquor License Commissioners to exchange their class BD7 license to a class A7 beer, wine, and liquor license. And this bill was also introduced on uh, March 8th, 2021. And the bill sponsor um, again is uh, Councilman Stokes. You know, can I make a comment, Madam Chair, real quick? Yes, you may, sir. Real quick, all three of these bills, you know, from a B7 to an A7, but I want um, to know that the, the community is glad that they close at 7, 10 o'clock at night. And the people that are on the bar are glad they close at 10 o'clock at night. So mm -hmm. it is a win win for everybody. Thank you. That's good news. Um, the committee will now hear from the agency representatives and we'll again start with the city solicitor's office, Elena DePedro. Good afternoon. One last time, Elena DePedro for the Baltimore City Law Department. For all the same reasons, we approve this bill for form and legal, legal sufficiency complies with the state law. Thank you. The Board of Liquor License Commissioners, Nick Blendy. Good afternoon again, Madam Chair, Nicholas Blendy, Deputy Executive Secretary for the Board of Liquor License Commissioners of Baltimore City. And again, uh, stand by our report and happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Thank you, Nick. And the Department of Finance, Mara James. Thank you. Yes, Mara James for the Department of Finance. Uh, again, we stand by our report. We do not oppose. Thank you. And the Police Department. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Shannon Conway with Baltimore Police Department, and we stand by our report and we have no objection to this bill. Thank you. And the Department of Transportation, Liam Davis. Chair, Liam Davis, Baltimore City DOT. We stand by our bill report. No objection. Thank you. 
and the health department, uh, DePaul Nibber. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, DePaul Nibber on behalf of the Baltimore City Health Department. Uh, again, this, bit, this business was found to be in good standing. Um, we have no objections to this bill. Thank you. And now we'll, we're checking to see if there's any hand raised for testimony. And there are not any hands raised, and we're now checking to see if any callers want to testify on this bill. And there are no callers. So now we're moving. We have to vote on that bill. Do I have a motion to move the bill, the last uh, liquor oh. bill? Moved by Councilman Second Conway. And second by Conway. That moves favorable. Chair Middleton, yes. Councilman Bullock? Yes. Yes. Councilman Dorsey is absent. Councilman Conway? Yes. Is a yes. Councilman Glover? Yes, yes. ma'am. Thank you. Councilwoman Ramos? Yes. Thank you, and Councilman Stokes. Yes. Thank you, and this will uh, move. This bill will move to second reader at the next council meeting, and the next bill is Bill Number Twenty One Dash Zero Zero Five Seven, Repeal Rice's Town Plaza Transit Station Urban Renewal Area and Plan for the purpose of the repeal Ordinance Zero Nine Dash. 219, which established the Town Plaza Transit Station Urban Renewal Area and Plan and providing for a special effective date. The public notice um, affidavits were, um, have been received. This bill was introduced on March 22nd, 2021, and the bill sponsor was sponsored by Councilman Schleifer. And Councilman Schleifer, uh, do you would you like to make some comments? Sure. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, so this bill, uh, for those of us who are um, who were here last term, uh, actually passed through last term, and unfortunately, due to the end of the term, uh, it ended up dying out with a whole series of other bills that did not pass um, fully in time and be signed by the mayor. I'm pretty sure, um, and I guess somebody can correctly correct me if I'm mistaken, but I'm pretty sure it passed completely. It just wasn't signed uh, or vetoed, I guess, at the end of the term. There's no reason to actually veto this bill. Um, the the key uh, reason were that I put in this stuff, um, and I think Caroline Hecker's on here, um, and if, if you'd allowed her to speak, um, she can give a little bit more details. But I met out at a, um, a site in my district uh, with a really great operator who has uh, provides services to low-income seniors. Um, in different areas in the city. And so basically it's sort of like a, a senior day day center where uh, there's activities and other resources for seniors there and they really help them along with everything that they need to help these seniors uh, age, age in place in their homes, which I think um, is something very important that we should do. We have a lot of seniors um, in the city that have been living in the same homes for 50 years. Uh, and it's our responsibility as elected leaders to do everything we can to help them stay in their homes um, and to you know be where they want to be. And so um, this this program really is excellent. Uh, the site couldn't be couldn't be better uh, for their use. And in fact, all of the neighbors around there uh, have been in full support of this project. Uh, so it really was just an unfortunate timing. Uh, and so that's why I have reintroduced it, and I you know, respectfully ask that the committee uh, approve this bill. Uh, thank you, Councilman. And we'll have Carolina on as soon as we get through the agency reports. Okay, thank you. Um, the committee will now hear the agency representatives and we'll start with the city solicitor's office. Um, it's Hillary. Uh, hi, Council. Hillary. Yes, we stand by a report. There's uh, no legal issue with this. Thank you. The Planning Commission. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the uh, committee. This bill was referred to the Planning Commission and heard by them on April 22nd. 
Um, and as is mentioned by the sponsor, it was uh, a returning bill. Um, we recommend favorably for the repeal of the URP. Um, it was originally uh, created in 1981 and then was redone in 2009. Uh, then our comprehensive rezoning of the city came through and, and became effective in 2017, which again put the plan back out of date because it refers to everything in the old zoning code. Uh, so without needing to go through a complete comprehensive update of the urban renewal plan, uh, we believe that a repeal is the more prudent way to go. Um, just by way of background, with many of our urban renewal plans that had design controls and special use controls, things of that nature, uh, we attempted to take the best of those and put them into the new zoning code. Uh, so we now have a design manual. We now have required design reviews for certain things. Uh, so we think that that's covered um, by the basics of the zoning code and that this plan is no longer necessary and recommend its repeal. Thank you. Any questions to the Planning Commission from the committee? Moving on, um, the Department of Housing and Community Development, and we have Stephanie Murdoch. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Stephanie Murdoch, Legislative Liaison for DHCD. We stand by our bill report. We have no objection to the passage of this bill. Thank you, Stephanie. The Department of Public Works. Thank you, Madam Chair. Marcia Collins representing the Department of Public Works. Uh, we are here in support of the legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the Commission on uh, Historical Architecture and Preservation, better known as CHAPS. Do we have a representative, either Eric Holcomb or Stacy Montgomery? And I don't have a report from them as well. Okay. So we have no report. Um, is does the um, I don't think it's the chap district? Okay. The Baltimore Development Corporation. Madam Chair, uh, good afternoon. The Baltimore Development Corporation supports uh, the passage of Bill 210057. Thank you, Dave Garza. And the Department of Transportation, Liam Davis. Madam Chair, we stand by our bill report. Uh, excuse me, this is Liam Davis, Baltimore City DOT. We stand by our bill report, no objection. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Um, we'll now take public testimony and we'll start with Caroline Hector. Hector, do you want to make comments on this particular bill or are you waiting for the next? Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Caroline Hecker, Rosenberg, Martin Greenberg, on behalf of the applicant. Um, I'd just like to thank Councilman Schleifer very briefly for introducing the bill and for his introduction of what it's supposed to accomplish today. Um, I uh, am here with Victoria Campbell, who is my client, the contract purchaser of the property. Um, I think maybe the the meat of the, the application is probably better for the next hearing on the rezoning bill, um, but this bill and the rezoning bill that follows it are introduced together as companion bills. We need both in order to authorize the proposed adult daycare use at this location. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but we can go into more detail with the next bill if it is something bill. Okay. You are kind of, we can hear you, but you are kind of muffled a little bit. I don't know where that's coming from, but um, we, I think we did hear you. Uh, any, any questions on this particular bill from the committee? Um, Madam Chair. This is um, Matt Stegman. I, I just wanted to point out for the committee's reference, I know you said that uh, we did not have a report on file from CHAP. Uh, I did pull the report for the identical bill from last uh, last session, and at that time, uh, CHAP did not have any objection and, and did note that the, uh, the bill as proposed did not have any impact on uh, their review of um, yes. yeah, historic, uh, historic districts and assets. Thank you, Matt, for giving us that added information. Um, so there are no amendments to this bill. Is there a motion to move the, the um, oh, look, I'm skipping over, checking for public testimony first. Any other public testimony? Ra use your raise hand function. As mentioned earlier, if you would like to testify on this bill. And I see, and there are no hands raised. So, Madam, Madam Chair, um, if I may, uh, Ms. Campbell, who's in the attendees, 
Um, she okay. she's the applicant, so I'm not sure if you wanted to I'll elevate her. In. It's up to you. So, okay, Miss Campbell, are you unmuted? Hello, Miss Campbell. She's not, she doesn't seem to be responding. Okay. So are there any other callers present that would like to testify? Okay, she's still not responding. Miss Campbell? They're gonna to try to unmute her again. Miss Campbell, can you hear us? Okay, hearing no response. Is there a motion to move the bill? Oh, she just uh, she just posted in the comments that she's having trouble with her audio. I think she has to click that she wants to use her computer audio in order to uh, be able to be to be heard. Okay. Or right, you guys can proceed. Okay. So there um, are there amendments on this bill? No amendments. So do I have a motion to move? Uh, bill number 21-0058. Who was that? Glover. 570057. Councilman Glover moved. Council second, one. Ramos. Yeah. Ramos, second. This bill will move favorable. Chair Middleton, yes. Councilman Bullock? Yes. Is a yes. Councilman Conway? Yes. Yes. Is a yes. Councilman Dorsey is absent. Uh, Councilman Glover? Yes. Is a yes. Councilwoman Ramos? Yes. Is a yes. And Councilman Stokes is a yes. Whoops, sorry. Thank Councilman you. Stokes. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Councilman. This bill will move to second reader at the next council meeting. And then next, we have bill number 21-0053, rezoning 4207 to 4209 Menlo Drive for the purpose of changing the zoning for the property known as 4207 to 4209 Menlo Drive as outlined in red on the accompanying plat from the I-1 zoning district to the OIC zoning district and providing for a special effective date. The public notice affidavits were received. Uh, this bill was introduced on March 22nd, 2021, and the bill was sponsored by uh, Councilman Slifer. Councilman Slifer, did you have comments on this bill? Sure. So this is connected to the previous bill, and uh, this site is located in Menlo Industrial Park, uh, so right off of Reisterstown Road. Uh, on Menlo and the site had been vacant for some time and so this is a welcome addition to, to come and uh, bring it back bring that site back to life um, I see that Miss Campbell uh, the applicant uh, just switched over to her phone so uh, when you get to that part of the hearing I think if you try to unmute her then she'll probably be able to speak thank okay you. you're finished your comments on this bill Yes, thank you. Okay. Miss Campbell, are you, can you hear us? Hold, hold on. Miss Campbell, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Okay, can so we you? have, yes, we have moved into the Menlo Drive bill, but I understand your comments are going to be on the previous bill or okay. this bill. Oh, the it's all yes on this bill and previous yes. So um, go ahead. I'll allow you to do your comments so we can move on with the agency re representatives. Okay. Um, as this project is, I'm very passionate about just because of the services we can offer our seniors in this area, the two one two one five corridor. Um, we are we were successful in having a zero. Um, positive rate in the during the pandemic and was able to 
keep our clients' medical appointments and outings and intact without exposing them to the coronavirus. Um, I think it's going to be a vital function for the Menlo Project because of the, the, the vast of senior homes we have in the area and the long-term residents that are coming out of the nursing homes and now looking to come into the community um, to provide the medical services that we offer. Um, I like to pride ourselves on a one-stop um, facility where we give the somatic medical needs, the psychiatry, the case management, the medical, the medical assistance, the insurance, the Medicare. They're getting all of their services in the community while being safe and being transported to and from wherever they need to go by providing virtual and one-on-one -on -one sessions. So, like I said, it was a vital part in the 21215 corridor for it to work. Um, we have 125 clients currently. This space would allow us to have 250 more. So it definitely was a huge impact, I believe, when the um, pandemic started. We got every client in the facility vaccinated, um, and we were able to open up as soon as the Governor Hogan in May 1st released that adult daycares could have opened. Um, it was definitely a tragic time when we did close down May 17th, but that did not stop my services. I still was able to transport the client's medication, provide them virtual learning by bringing the tablets to their home, um, providing food services while we, were, while we were down. We never stopped. Even though the funding ceased, I continued servicing all 125 of my clients and was able to successfully bring them all back. With the Menlo Project, we will be providing over 80 jobs by providing, we'll be giving 250 more residents the same services that we're currently doing at the Bannister location. So I know with the urban repeal, it's certain zones and the way how it's, the way how it's coded now that it's industrial, but this place was a church and was able to provide the services and before it was grand, before the new zoning laws took place. So I'm just hoping that we can be able to restore back the old zoning um, rezoning that it was that it was prior so that we can service the area once again. Thank you so much for your um, testimony. That was important. Um, um, I just I just have one question. Where where are you located now? I know you're moving to an area. Where are you where have you been located now presently? Two one two one five um, location. We're not moving. Um, it just will be oh. a second location. Oh. A second. Road. Um, it will be a second location for us. Um, okay. It would um, South Spring Avenue, right behind Sinai. We receive most of LifeBridge clients um, along that area, and we do. Re John Hopkins is another provider of ours, um, and Bond Secure. So we're all we're we get a lot of referrals from all area hospitals, and the nursing home has been. We've been inundated because all of the clients are now being shipped from long-term care to the adult date setting because they realized that was the most effective way to move through the pandemic. Thank you. And thank you for that clarification. So it's a second location. Your testimony is important. Yes. Um, uh, Councilman Slifer, any, any further comments or we can go ahead and move on to the agency reports? No, we can move ahead. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and start with the Planning Commission. Um, Eric Tiso. Good afternoon again, Madam Chair, and members of the committee. Uh, this bill is again referred to the Planning Commission and reviewed by them in their public meeting of April 22nd. Uh, unfortunately, the Planning Commission had to recommend disapproval. So when we look at rezonings of property, uh, we're obligated to look at the uh, state required standards for rezoning. Uh, we don't believe that this one quite meets that. And again, uh, you know, it's not a particular applicant. We have to look at the property and, and the surrounding context uh, in, in general terms. Uh, so we understand that this was uh, an available property, uh, but it is industrially zoned where the daycare use is not a permitted use. Um, as was mentioned, religious institutions are permitted in the industrial districts. Uh, there was a, a big case in 2000, uh, Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, which uh, required um, that to be have religious uses anywhere you can have uh, public assembly. So that's the reason why that was permissible uh, with the previous zoning code and would continue today. Uh, without going into too, too much uh, detail, we're uh, in essence concerned that 
um, designating the single property as an OIC, an office industrial campus, uh, in the middle of the I-1 uh, zone is, is not an appropriate rezoning. Um, we worry what it will do for the rest of the industrial district. Um, we believe there are other commercial properties uh, that could be available. Uh, we don't see a particular uh, call for this individual property to be rezoned. Um, and there's more details in our staff report, but we believe it just falls short of uh, the required findings to support a rezoning. Thank you. So that was disapproval from the Planning Commission. So committee, I think it would be important to, uh, as I go down the list for agency reports, before we, uh, if you have any questions, I think we need to hear out the um, remainder of the agency reports and, um, and then also go back to Caroline Hecker and then um, I, that's when I think we can phrase any, raise any questions that you have um, to the agencies. So we'll go ahead and move to the Board of uh, Municipal Zoning and Administration. Is anyone here representing that department? Madam Chair, Nina Thumless with the Mayor's Office of Government Relations. Uh, a representative from BMZA was not available to attend this afternoon, but they do defer to the recommendation and report of the Planning Commission. Thank you. Uh, and then the Department of Transportation. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Liam Davis, Baltimore City DOT. Um, we stand by our bill report, which is no objection. Thank you. And the um, City Solicitor's Office. Hello, Madam Chair. This is Hillary Ruley from the Law Department. Uh, our bill notes, obviously, like any rezoning, you'd have to find sufficient facts to support it. And obviously, there's an indication here that this might be spot zoning. And so in order to overcome that, you'd also have to find that this was in the interest of the general public uh, and that it complies with the um, the um, master plan for the area, uh, comprehensive plan for the area, and it's not just for the benefit of the private land owner. So assuming you can find the facts and meet that test, we would approve it for form and legal sufficiency. Thank you, Hillary. Can you just explain or what spot zoning is for the committee? Sure. Spot zoning is where a government rezones one parcel or a few small parcels, basically for the benefit of the owner and not in keeping with the comprehensive development plan for the area in general. It's usually for the benefit of, of just the, the landowner. Um, so in general, zoning is supposed to be district-based and you're supposed to have similar categories of things available in each district. And then, of course, the processes exist for, you know, conditional uses and things like that, or you can rezone. And if you're not rezoning comprehensively, which the last time we did that was transform, if you're rezoning on a piecemeal basis, you have to find that the last comprehensive rezoning, either uh, it was a mistake to zone this property in a particular way, or that the whole area, the neighborhood has changed so much since transform that it doesn't make sense anymore. So you have to find one of those two in every single rezoning. But when there's an allegation of spot zoning, there's someone's, you know, there's facts to indicate that perhaps this doesn't meet the city's comprehensive plan. And that's what Mr. Tiso testified to. This looks like spot zoning because it does not meet the city's plan. So in order for... <laughs> you'd have to show that it that it does meet that plan and it's not just for the private interest of the owner. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary, for explaining that for the committee. Uh, moving on to the Department of Housing and Community Development. Stephanie Murdoch. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Again, Stephanie Murdoch with the Department of Housing and Community Development. We stand by our bill report, which was in deference to the law department. Thank you. And now uh, BDC, Baltimore Development Corporation. And I was looking for Dave Garza. Uh, 
Okay, so we don't have Dave Garza on, but it, um, Nina, did you want to speak for the for BDC? Uh, Madam Chair, it looks like David Garza from the BDC is on as an attendee. He must have gotten um, kicked off or had some technical difficulties. If he can be elevated to speak. Okay, uh, Dave, you're unmuted. Hello, there seems to be some problems. Yeah, hold on. Hold on. Um, so it's not allowing him, it's not allowing us to make him a panelist or unmute him. Hold on, they're trying one other thing. No, he dropped out again. Um, so Nina, I do see here that they, uh, the BDC did oppose the this um, bill as well. So if he gets back on while we're doing this, where he can explain, we'll make try to get him back on. Um, the Department of Finance, Mara James. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair. I believe we were referred to this bill somewhat in error. We don't um, usually get rezoning bills, so we okay. just did not take a stance. Okay. So we're going to go ahead. Um, are there any questions at this point, or I'm going to go ahead and let Caroline Hecker, um, I think her public testimony is important. Um, and because the planning department disapproved of the rezoning, um, Madam Chair, we Madam Chair. must. Is that Dave? Hello? Uh, no, it's uh, me, Madam Chair. I had a question. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Go ahead, uh, Councilman. You have a question before we move to Caroline? Yes, please. Um, I, I was curious of the, the planning department and understanding. Um, the the owner's allusion to it being used by a church before you said that it that that could be used by a religious institution under the current um can you explain that a little bit just what the difference is and how that usage is all that different um for, from this use sure uh so right as i was uh getting hired by the city in 2000 uh was the wake of a landmark case the rluipa or lupa um, where we initially did not permit religious uses in our industrial districts um, and the reason for doing this and, and excluding other uses generally speaking uh, is because commercial and residential can outcompete and outspend industrial all day long um, but there were other types of uses that would allow uh, public assembly of people and so that case basically required if you can have an assembly of people then you must also allow religious land uses so we had to modify our code to meet that requirement uh, so uh, you could have a religious uh, institution under our old code or under this uh, current one um, when we were creating the new zoning code just to expand a little bit further uh, we created the office industrial uh, campus to try and be a lighter industrial uh, type use that would allow a mixture of uses including some office uh, type things that would support uh, lighter cleaner industrial um, we did include uh, daycare center um, in there and our original concept was that uh, it was to be an accessory use um, and daycare centers cover both adult and children uh, at the same time so that's kind of how we landed where we are So, um, and, and this industrial use could, um, and maybe this is not this case, but if, um, if you had uh, a warehouse industrial use uh, and they wanted to put a daycare for their employees there, would that be covered here? Uh, if they were in an office industrial campus, that would be permitted. And that was the reason for selecting this zone to satisfy this particular client's needs. Um, and we do appreciate that uh, you know, the request was to try and keep it as close to industrial in its spectrum as possible and not just go to a C zone, uh, which would bring in a lot more potential for competition. Uh, so we, we appreciate that. But again, uh, we're obligated to look at it from a more general lens of meeting uh, the requirements um, for rezoning and not from a particular applicant's point of view. Okay, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. 
You're welcome. And uh, just, just, just a note, I got, I received a, a text from uh, Dave Garza from BDC. His, his computer froze, but he did say that BDC stands by its report for City Council Bill 21-0053, which is opposed. Um, Councilman Slifer. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, and first of all, I want to I want to thank Hillary for uh, giving us a more thorough explanation. Um, and so I just want to also just address that a little bit for those who are unfamiliar with this location, uh, which I believe is important to the finding of the facts uh, for the committee. And I'll allow Caroline to correct me if I misspeak at all. But you know, this location is not your typical industrial park that 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 one. When you think industrial park, you would think of this. This location is actually sandwiched between two popular churches, the Genesis Bible uh, Fellowship Ministries and also the Empowerment Temple. Uh, this location also within um, right off of right on Reisterstown Road, there's also a daycare uh, right nearby. This is very much a community uh, location. And I think an important thing to know when we talk about the master plan, I, you know, I don't know everything that went into two terms ago when the rezoning took place, but, but I do believe that uh, when it comes to this location um, and it comes to certain parts of the city, like in my district, I do believe the zoning, the rezoning got it wrong in some of these spots. Now, obviously you can't have it perfect across the board. Uh, but one thing I want to point out as far as my district is concerned and the master plan of my district is that you have, uh, when you look at the uh, Neighborhood Indicators Alliance, which um, is, is run at a University of Baltimore uh, that many people might be familiar with, uh, where it has all the different indicators across all communities in the city. Uh, one of the things that, that you'll see when looking up this particular area is the age and you know the, uh, the life expectancy is extremely high in this area compared to many other uh, areas in the city. And so um, in the Northwest Corridor, you do have a great need for for programming for seniors like what this services are offering which frankly um the city is not meeting this need and so you know here's a really great opportunity to help those seniors you know i know when uh you know in particular if you for anybody who's been to the pimlico racetrack uh, uh recently which this site is nearby there you'll see um just you'll see a lot of seniors who've lived in those in those homes for some of them are original owners, 50 years plus, and, um, and they need these services um, in those locations. And so when we look at major redevelopments like the Pimlico Racetrack redevelopment, I think it certainly warrants um, a need to, to take a second look and to do a rezoning of this property uh, because of the changes that are taking place already in the area and also just the need of this entire community as opposed to just looking at, you know, overall in the city uh, what the needs are. Um, so this is certainly going to address a tremendous need, especially for low income seniors uh, who are trying to survive staying in their house. And these services are are expanding their life expectancy. So I think it's, it's certainly very warranted. Um, and I would welcome even more uh, similar services to participate in that area. Um, and, and frankly, any area in my district that's going to help expand uh, the life expectancy of the seniors in my district, and I'm and I'm highly confident that um, that this fits in line with the direction that we are going as as a district. Um, the Pimlico Racetrack redevelopment, um, which borders mine and Council uh, uh, Council Vice President Middleton's district, you know that is going to change the entire region. And so uh, to look at you know what was you know what was done even five years ago, in my opinion, is is severely outdated. Uh, considering this whole racetrack redevelopment uh, is as recent as really this past year. And so um, so I, I do think the finding of the facts uh, should reflect that this is, is certainly an appropriate uh, rezoning. But I'll, I'll defer to Caroline because uh, lawyers always have a different, a different angle on it. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilman. And before we put on Caroline, I just want to say because the planning department disapproves of the zoning, um, we must provide testimony regarding your required findings and um, a copy of your written findings were sent to committee members. And so now we're going to have Caroline Hecker give her testimony of the findings and other 
um, important information that uh, needs to be heard. So Caroline, you're on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Caroline Hecker, Rosenberg, Martin Greenberg, on behalf of the applicant, Victoria Campbell, who is the contract purchaser of the property. Um, Councilman Schleifer sort of stro stole my thunder a little bit in terms of what the, you know, the basis of the proposed rezoning is. Um, but just as a refresher for, for those council members who were part of the former city council, this bill was passed by the council in the last term. And unfortunately, it was not signed by the mayor at the end of the, um, the council term. Uh, but we're basically doing a little redo this term, but, um, you know, the, the, the findings that the last city council made are very similar to the findings that we're asking the council to make today. I did submit written findings as um, Madam Chair alluded to, and I hope you've had a chance to read them, but I'll, I'll go through them in a little bit of detail. Um, as a preliminary matter, this is not a total change in the type of zoning district that exists there currently. What we have today is the I-1 zoning district, and what we're proposing is the OIC zoning district, which is another type of industrial district. It's not a commercial district and it's not out of character with what's there. And there is case law that says that where you have a property that's being reclassified from one subcategory within a type of district to a different subcategory, then there's a, a more liberal standard applied. It's a little bit easier to approve a rezoning when you're, you're rezoning from one subcategory to a different subcategory, which is what we have here. Now, as Councilman Schleifer suggested, um, there have been significant changes since the Transform Baltimore rezoning, the Pimlico redevelopment, um, and there's also the redevelopment of the Reisterstown Plaza Transit Station, which was announced in 2019 after the um, Transform Baltimore had become uh, effective. And with the redevelopment of these two projects, we're going to see a huge increase in residential, um, in residential use and in mixed use throughout this corridor. And I think it's appropriate that the zoning change to accommodate these types, you know, these types of uses that can support the increased residential uh, capacity in the area. Um, I know that the the specific proposed use as an adult daycare is not directly relevant to the rezoning, and you know, the, the rezoning stands independently of, of who the actual user is and what's going to occur there. But this is a case where we have a, a user who offers a service that's particularly important or has been particularly important during the pandemic to allow seniors to age in place in their homes. Uh, the way that, that they operate is that they, they um, pick them up in the morning, they bring them to the, the daycare facility, they see all of their doctors and dentists and physical therapists and psychiatrists, psychologists, all of those um, service professionals all visit the patient, the clients in the daycare center, um, and then they're returned home to their, their families in the afternoon. So there, there isn't traffic coming in and out that would interfere with other operations nearby. Um, and it really allows these seniors to, to go, uh, it's, it's you know, one-stop shopping for their, their healthcare needs. They, they go there during the day and they're cared for all day long. They're returned to their families in the evening. They're allowed to stay home. As Ms. Campbell indicated, they had a 0% positivity of, of the, the COVID um, illness among the patients. And so they've, you know, they really had great success with this while similar nursing homes were having really astronomical positivity rates. So it's worked really well. And it's, it's something that the community really needs to see, particularly again, as the community is shifting to even more residential and more um, you know, mixed use from its, its former industrial roots. Now, in terms of the specific findings that the, the committee and the city council is required to make, um, there has been a shift in population. This um, census district has seen a growth of about 400 people, uh, which is you know, not, not an insignificant increase within a census tract. So there clearly is an increase in population occurring. Um, there are available public facilities. The area is well served and the, the rezoning of this property to the OIC district won't have any negative impact on the availability of public facilities. Um, there, with the, the Reisterstown Transit Station, there are um, you know, adequate and probably more than adequate uh, transit options. This will not have an impact on transportation patterns, particularly, as I mentioned, this particular use uh, they, you know, they they control all of their own traffic with their own vans in which they use to to pick up their patients and bring them to the facility. The facility, the property includes a large parking area for their their vans, so they don't need to park on the street or interfere with traffic of other 
operators that are coming and going. Um, this proposed use and the proposed rezoning is compatible with the existing and proposed development for the area, particularly the Pimlico redevelopment and the Reisterstown Transit Station redevelopment. Um, and we've heard from the Planning Commission and the Zoning Board on their, their recommendations, and we obviously respectfully, we disagree. And I do think that this is consistent with the city's master plan, as Councilman Schleifer testified. This is really, you know, goes entirely in line with what is proposed for this area generally, um, you know, with the other redevelopments that are occurring in the area. Um, with regard to the other factors that the, the council is required to consider, um, the existing uses of the property within the general area, you know, there, this is a, you know, it's, it's an area that's zoned industrial, but it isn't strictly industrial uses that, that we see in this area. It is more of a mixed use and, and having the property zoned OIC will allow some additional flexibility, you know, whether it's for this use or for a future use. Uh, that goes along with the other other types of uses that are in the area. There are religious institutions, there are carry out food facilities, and there's a large office complex within the, the a few blocks of, of this property. Um, you know, and, and similarly with regard to the zoning classification of other properties in the vicinity, you know, there are commercially zoned properties within a block of the property. They're within three blocks of residentially zoned properties, and we're within a few blocks of other OIC and other transit-oriented development zone properties. So there, this is clearly an area that has a mix of, of use types and a mix of zoning classifications, and the OIC that's proposed for this site is not out of character with the, the surrounding area. Uh, the property is suitable for the use in question. It, it, it works beautifully the way that it's laid out. Um, as Ms. Campbell mentioned in her testimony, it was previously used as a church. It's it's essentially a big um, you know, vacant shell that can be fit out in, in any number of ways uh, to support the proposed use. And because it contains its own parking port within the property, it won't have any impact on uh, the neighboring properties in terms of skill of the parking. And then finally, on the, the required findings, the uh, trend of development in the area, as, as I've indicated, it, it has shifted significantly since Transform was enacted with the, the proposed redevelopment of the Pimlico project and the Reisterstown Transit Station. Um, you know, this, this area really has seen a substantial change in the character of the community, and it is continuing to see that type of change as, as residential uses become more and more um, prevalent in this area. And then finally, I would I would add a point about equity because the planning commission has taken um, they've started studying this a lot more the concept of equity and rezoning, um, and and so it's sort of heightened my awareness of it. But I think there's a really strong argument to be made that having these industrial areas be limited to purely industrial uses puts a burden on the nearby residential communities that that is arguably inequitable when they don't have access to this type of to the types of services and, and uses that can support the residential community, it forces them to go farther away and to look harder and have, have a more difficult time to find the type of services that they need to support the residences. Whereas if you have a more mixed use area, which is what we're proposing, a more mixed use type of, of zoning for this property, it creates a, a greater opportunity and more equity for the residents of the surrounding residential areas to get the services that they need. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. I have submitted the um, written findings of fact. I would also note that there is a letter of support in there from the Glen Neighborhood Association. We also met with all the surrounding property owners and they're all in support of the proposed reason. Thank you, Caroline, for your testimony. And um, I did see, is she still on? Oh, there we go. Um, Councilwoman Ramos, you had a question? Yes, Madam Chair, if you don't mind, um, sure. I have a question for Ms. Hecker and maybe also for the sponsor. Um, so it sounds like there's some transformation happening in the neighborhood. So why aren't we rezoning that whole area and not just this one property? That's a fair question. Um, from from my client's perspective and my perspective, you know, we, we only control the one property. We can't go around rezoning our neighbor's properties. I agree with you. I think that the area probably could have been and should have been rezoned to the OIC district as part of Transform. I think it would, I think there are certainly facts available to support a rezoning of the entire area right now. Um, but that was just beyond the scope of what we could accomplish on the limited time frame that we had you know, during our diligence period to acquire this property. Yeah, and um, I, I agree with that. Um, I do believe that we sh that we should, uh, but 
you know, that obviously would take a lot, a lot more resources and a lot more time. A lot of the local uh, business owners and others there would, so, would fully support that. Uh, in fact, I don't think there'd be anybody opposing to that, but um, I guess uh, Caroline probably doesn't want to volunteer by uh, the next two months of her time to, to go through and draft all that stuff up. So. Okay. And then um, are some of the properties around there already, are, are, are all the properties um, occupied? that are around there? I believe most of them are. Um, we, we reached out to the properties on um, the immediate either sides and behind us and when we spoke to them, they're, they're operating businesses. They had no objection to our proposed rezoning. There's sort of a mix of things there. There's, I think, a caterer, um, light manufacturers. There's a um, company that manufactures airplane parts, I believe. Um, there's a, sort of a mix of things around there, but they seem to be the ones in the immediate vicinity of the site appear to be occupied. Yeah, there's not there's not very many vacancies there. And when there are vacancies, they're they're taken uh, pretty quickly, which is why, you know, this this property in particular had sat vacant for, for a while, uh, which is not normal for the area there. Um, and so this is a great solution. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Ms. Hecker. I mean, I'm totally in, in favor of an adult um, daycare facility because we do need those services. Um, I just had these these technical questions, you know, still learning the, the ropes here. Um, and uh, it seems to me like it does meet the uh, one of the criteria around the public use piece, um, which is, is an important piece. So thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, to the sponsor and to Ms. Hecker. Uh, any other questions to Ms. Hecker before we move on to see if there's any other testimony? Hearing none, we're checking to see if there's any I other. Who's, I one who is speaking? Glover. Oh, Glover, this Councilman is, uh, Glover. Uh, Councilman Glover, go ahead. Yeah, I just, yeah, just want to know. Uh, exactly what is the uh population of seniors with this facility be able to uh hold and uh what are the hours of operation they'll be able to serve an additional 250 seniors at this location um, they'll create 80 jobs in doing so and they open early in the morning i believe they, they pick up their um, patients between seven and eight and they return them to their homes around three o'clock in the afternoon and what are the requirements for uh, a senior to uh, participate in this program? That is a good question. I would have to defer to Ms. Campbell on that. I'm not sure if she's still on the line here. I am. Ms. Campbell, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, the requirements is a low income, so they have to be Medicaid recipients. Um, for the scene for an, any adult daycare, there's two requirements. They have to have a level of care that is issued through the state of Maryland. The state nurse come out and do an assessment on the on the uh, individual, and they have to have a uh, they have to have Medicaid insurance. Now, with my facility, even if they do not qualify for Medicaid, I still offer the services to them. Okay, cool. That's what I wanted to know. So. If they didn't have Medicaid uh, services, would you still be willing to uh, have seniors uh, to be a part of those programs? I'm really yes. big on seniors. Um, you know, they're the backbones of our communities, they're the treasures of our communities. And uh, I have no problem with, uh, with seniors uh, in the council district. So I fully support uh, any initiative when it comes to helping uh, our legacy residents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank now you. we're checking. You're welcome. Now we're checking to see if there's any other testimony. And we don't see any other raised hands. Um, we're checking calls. Faith, Faith Leach, are you here to testify? On this bill, Faith I am not Lee. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's it. Okay, that's it. So, um, 
Before we go ahead and take a motion, I do just want to comment um, as um, Councilman Slifer did mention. So um, our um, districts do kind of uh, butt against each other and um, very familiar with the area. And it is a it's it's a, a lot going on in that area, a whole lot of seniors, different um, uh, diverse in race, diverse in religion. Um, uh, it's just a lot going on and the services are definitely needed. And as we know, we're really trying to um, take care of our families in this city. And this is one way to uh, move in a progressive way. So on that note, are there any more questions from the committee to the agencies or uh, the public testimony that we've had? On that note, is there a motion to approve the finding of the facts? Motion. Motion Second. by I have a question. In, we, we have to decide which finding of facts we're uh, voting on, correct? Because there's the finding of the facts with the planning mm -hmm. department, and then there's the finding of the facts from the um, Our, Ms. Um, Ecker, Councilwoman, so no, there's only written find and testimony finding of the facts from Caroline Hecker. The planning commission, um, we're just... Uh, it's just those are the only finding of the facts that we have. So there's just one. I thought that the planning commission's, uh, the planning department's memo has a whole set of findings and we usually vote those if we don't have any other findings. I'm just trying to, I don't, again, learning. So I'm just trying to figure out if we have to be specific as to the findings that we're passing. So in, Caroline, in Caroline's letter, all the finding of the facts are written and she, and she spoke about each one of them. Madam Chair, can I step in uh, for a second? Yes. Uh, so thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, thank you, uh, Councilman Ramos. Um, I'll just add this piece. So one of the challenges we go through again is when um, there's, there's a conflict and essentially uh, what happens in some of these cases is that um, there'll be an applicant and there'll be a representative of the applicant. And that representative then puts forward um, uh, findings of facts based upon the argument that they're making. And so now it's about adopting that on behalf of the applicant. So, so your question is a good one. Essentially, you have the position that the plan department has, but then you have the applicant and the sponsor of the bill put forth this piece. And so that's the question at hand, whether we're adopting that finding of facts. Okay, I just want to make sure that the motion is very specific about which facts we're finding. So that, and I don't know whether we need to be or if these are the only facts presented. Because normally, when there aren't any other facts, we just adopt the finding of the facts from the planning department. And so in this case, there are two. There's, you know, the other findings. So I just didn't know whether we had to be very specific about so, the facts that um, we we're finding. Councilwoman Rob Ramos. So we have council staff, and they are taking notes. And they're going to be specifically written and oral statements. We have written and oral statements specifically in this hearing. And that's one of the um, uh, jobs of the, the our council staff. So those are the ones that we basically are voting on. Made from her written statement. Made from her written statement. So that's the proposal that I am asking um, to make a motion to approve the finding of the facts that Caroline Hecker has presented to us. And Councilman Glover made the motion and who did I get a second by? Or did I get a second? Conway. Conway. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. And thank you, uh, Councilman Bullock. You're welcome. Um, Chair Middleton, yes. Councilman Bullock? Yes. Is a yes. Dorsey is absent. Councilman Conway? Yes. Is a yes. Councilman Glover? Absolutely, yes. Is a yes. Councilwoman Ramos? 
Yes. Is a yes. And Councilman Stokes. Yes. Is a yes. So that was for the finding of the facts. Um, there is no amendments. So now we want to uh, move the bill. Do I have a, a motion to move the bill? So motion so to move. Second, Conway. So moved by Glover, second by Conway. Uh, moved favorable by Chair Middleton, yes. Um, Councilman Bullock. Yes. Is a yes. Councilman Conway. Yes. Is a yes. Councilman Dorsey absent. Councilman Glover. Yes. Is a yes. Councilwoman Ramos. Yes. Is a yes. And Councilman Stokes. Yes. And this bill and finding of the facts will be moved um, at the next council meeting. Thank you all for that. And uh, thank you, Councilman Slifer. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. Um, now we'll hear the last um, over legislative oversight, which is 21-0010. Um, and it's a briefing on the emergency security deposit relief for the purpose of reviewing the program which would allow for distribution of federal community services block grant funds to be used for emergency security deposits. We will, um, I see we have um, Alice Kennedy from the Department of Housing and Community Development. Alice, are you here? Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you for um, joining us today. And we also have Tisha Edwards from the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success. Yes, I'm yes. here, Madam thank, Chair. Thank you. And uh, we'll go ahead and basically, um, who would like to start first? I'm happy to start. Uh, this is Tisha Edwards, um, Executive Director of the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success. I want to thank you, um, Councilwoman Middleton, for giving us an opportunity uh, to apprise the council and the public of this um, initiative that was um, announced uh, by Mayor Scott just recently. I think it was a week or two ago at this point. My days are a little blurry, um, but uh, very recently. Um, and um, you know, I'm happy to give a very high level overview of the program, Councilwoman. Does that work for you? Yes, it does. And I just want to announce that we're not taking public testimony. This is just a briefing. Okay. So I'm put that. Okay, go ahead. Great. Thank you for that clarification. So, um, Councilwoman Middleton, this is really in response um, to what I think we all agree is an overwhelming need to make sure that we continue to work towards um, housing stability in Baltimore. Uh, and uh, because of COVID, we want to make sure that we have every available resource uh, pointed in that direction and that we don't have uh, families moving into homelessness and that we do provide the support that they need um, so that they're not in our shelters, they're not in our homeless um, system, and that there is um, housing available to those who are in need. So in effort to meet that goal, um, the mayor did um, uh, announce that we would start a security deposit assistance initiative. That program will launch in the fall. Um, and we are using our community services block grant resources uh, to fund this initiative. Um, families in need who meet uh, the income requirement, which is an income at 125% of the federal poverty level, um, will be eligible for up to $2,000 in um, security deposit assistance. Um, in addition, uh, families would need to be moving into um, 
uh, locations that are registered and licensed uh, within Baltimore City uh, have a lease uh, to prove that they uh, have uh, reached an agreement with the landlord for the location um, and provide documentation. That documentation can be cited in the lease um, that um, there is a security deposit requirement. Um, as I said, this is a relatively recent announcement. There's still a lot of additional policy work that we need to do on the back end to make sure that we have uh, the program ready for the fall and to make sure that it is compliant with um, community service block grant um, resources. But these are resources that were awarded to um, our CAP centers, uh, to support housing stability in response to COVID. And so this is a natural good use uh, of those resources. Thank you. And um, Alice Kennedy, did you want to add to that? I can. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chairs and members of the committee. Alice Kennedy, Acting Commissioner for DHCD. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, to just um, speak briefly about this and the expansion of uh, Baltimore City's eviction prevention program to include uh, designated funds to cover the cost of security deposits for uh, Baltimore City renters. Uh, DHCD regularly um, partners with the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success to ensure that all Baltimoreans have safe and stable housing. Uh, we've worked together on the eviction prevention program as well as other programs uh, related uh, with the CAP centers and social service programs between DHCD and MOCFS. To that end, uh, DHCD will work closely with all the partner agencies to ensure that all rental units that apply for this program are registered and licensed with DHCD. Uh, this was a requirement under our temporary rent, su program, rent support program, uh, which launched last summer in response to COVID-19 which then um, was a pilot program that led to the creation of the eviction prevention program. Baltimore City requires all residential units to be registered, inspected, and licensed to ensure that they meet basic safety and maintenance requirements. And you know, to receive that rental license, you have to meet two requirements to be registered with DHCD and also to be inspected by a state licensed uh, Baltimore City registered home inspect, uh, inspector. And to that end, we are um, supportive of MOCFS's efforts on this and we'll work closely with them as they look to implement the program. Thank you. So I know that, you know, we're at the beginning of this. We received the, um, you know, the announcement from the mayor. Um, I, and I'm, I don't know if some of my committee members have any questions? So I know there's still some work that you're working on, but I, if I have a few questions that I want to ask, and if you can answer them now, and this is both um, Miss Edwards and and you, uh, Alice. Um, my first question is: what What was the reasoning behind choosing um, eligibility to include those at 125 percent AMI? Uh, thank you for answering that question. That is a um, funding requirement of the state grant. So CSBG dollars do come with certain requirements um, mm -hmm. to make sure that we are meeting the needs of the target population. Any programming that we use um, CSBG dollars, we do have to have certain income thresholds. And so this is the threshold dictated by the state in order for us to, to access these resources. Okay. And then another question, um, What's the reason behind applying to um, city approved housing? What constitutes city approved housing? So I'm going to defer to Commissioner Kennedy on that because her agency leads the um, licensing process. OK, so the um, Madam Chair, the city approved uh, speaks directly to what I uh, just discussed in terms of the city's uh, licensing requirements for rental right. units. And this is something um, that we um, utilized during the temporary rent support program and would not provide uh, temporary rent support um, to a, a property that was unlicensed um, during that time, given that um, technically unlicensed uh, rentals are not 
legal and um, a landlord um, should not be receiving funds from a tenant to rent that space. And we want to ensure that um, all rental units are licensed across the city and safe. And we will work with MOCFS um, and work with landlords that, you know, we, we did this through TRS and we can look to do this with MOCFS as well, is that if an unlicensed unit arises, we would be made aware and also try to work with the landlord um, to bring them into compliance with the law. Do you, do you happen to have the current state of city approved housing stock? I do actually. Okay. So um, we have right now, currently there's about 28.3% of the properties are licensed, which actually represents 63.4% of all units. So we have the property, um, the licensing is done by the property, but we know that a property can have uh multi units within that property. We use the American uh, Community Survey data from 2016 and that uh, lists 100 and lists us having 130,615 occupied rental units within the city. Um, so we calculate that to be around a total of 66,424 rental properties. So um, we, will that will that meet our demand? Do you think? Will it meet? What I, yeah. What I, will, I will say to you, um, Councilwoman, is that the making sure that the properties are licensed is also a requirement of the back rent program. Mm -hmm. And landlords who are not licensed have been very willing to get licensed in order to receive the city subsidy. So we found great success, and we have not seen this as a barrier. Um, to accessing the uh, programs. Now, there are cases when tenants are be pursuing um, uh, locations that are un that are not habitable, um, and it is it is not suggested that they be in those locations. And if they're not habitable, then that raises a whole nother issue. But for the most part, we've had a lot of success working with DHCD in those. Um, locations that were not previously licensed, we're seeing this as a great incentive um, to get those um, uh, locations um, licensed. And I, I just want to commend um, Commissioner Kennedy and her team because they've been turning around those licenses rather quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have not seen that as a barrier at all in the workflow and access to resources. So is there an appeals process for the renter if their application for security deposit assistance is denied? So we have not gotten to that level of detail yet. That's one of the things that we will need to work through with the state. This is a program where we received an initial okay, but we've committed to coming back to them with some policy considerations. Um, and so once uh, we have those further deeper conversations with the state, I think we'll be able to, to speak more clearly to whether a, an appeal process is appropriate uh, for this program. Okay. And is there an outreach plan that, you know, to let individuals know, or are you still working on that? We are still working on it, and we would also do that in partnership with um, DHCD. And we have some great partners in the housing space, and the you know the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. I mean, there's just uh, the uh, the folks who are in the homelessness prevention space. So we've um, really benefited from having some really really rich partnerships in the housing arena, and so we feel very comfortable that once we have the details, that we will activate it across city agencies. But we're we're very confident based on our work that we did with the food program, our work that we've done with uh, back rent, we feel very confident that we're going to be able to meet the target population and have a broad and far reaching um, outreach campaign. But again, we will have more details on that when we get closer to launching the program. Okay. Um, any of my committee members, uh, oh, um, Councilwoman Ramos, is your hand up? Go ahead, Councilwoman. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, a lot of your questions were similar as, uh, that I had as well. Um, and then uh, uh, Ms. Edwards, just Director Edwards, just uh, talked a little bit about the outreach campaign. Um, 
one of the things that I found with the rental assistance, which by the way, has been great, um, is that, you know, when people come to us saying, hey, I really need help, and we could refer them to the rental assistance program, that may not always be the case with security deposit because people don't know that, you know, they need help with the security deposit as well. So how, I guess you'll let us know what the outreach strategy is going to be so that people know that they can come to us because I'm not sure a lot of the landlords even know, even though it benefits them. So I, I think you're 100% right, um, Councilwoman Ramos. The good news is, again, we have the infrastructure for this outreach. Um, uh, Commissioner Kennedy actually has a very, if you're licensed, then you're in our database. And as Commissioner Kennedy said, many landlords have more than one property. So we do have the ability to, to reach landlords. And I would just say that's evidence through our eviction prevention program. Uh, we're not finding any problems with any people um, signing up for that program. And so I think that we've built a good communications infrastructure that we're really going to be able to leverage and get to folks who need it. So we do have landlord contacts. Um, through DHCD and through the landlords that have participated in in the back rent program. So I think we have some some good opportunity. Of course, we can always do more and we want to spend down every dollar and it's only available for one year through September 2022. So we don't want to return any money um, and we want to get this to the families who need it the most. But I do think there's some infrastructure um, that already exists, but we will try to go grow that um, over time. Yeah, please use us as well. I mean, we, you know, want to put that out to our networks. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, I was, I had to unmute myself. Any other questions from the committee? So again, I want to, um, I want to thank uh, the administration and I want to thank particularly um, Alice and Tisha for you. Um, uh, taking the time to to do this briefing, um, as you know, we there's two important bills coming up with the council, and that's um, on the Security Deposit Act, and then the, that's June the 29th, and then there's also um, another bill coming up on uh, I think it's July 13th, and um, you know, I, I think we have shown how the, this is very important to the council and we definitely want to be partners and work hard together in getting the help we need for the families in our city. And um, it, we want to start, you know, with this, this briefing is very important to us. And it also important, I'm, I can see it's important to the both of you because you took your time um, in coming to this briefing and just sharing. So we're all excited and uh, hoping that this can be iron can be put out in the community as soon as possible. And we all 15 members of the council are ready to assist you the best way we can. Um, on that note, um, if there's no more questions from the council, um, this uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you.